Let's pray for understanding of God's word as we open it and look at it together and, and worship through the word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here together. Thank you for your grace and your kindness to us in the gospel. We pray that you would bless us now as we read your holy word. May we receive its truths with faith and love, lay them up in our hearts, and practice them in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is from Luke chapter 9. Luke 9. And I will read verses 23 through 27. But this morning's message will cover only verses 24 and 25. The last time we were together, we did verse 23. And this morning we will cover in the sermon verses 24 and 25, but we'll read 23 to 27. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. Luke 9, 23 to 27. This is God's word. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. <clears throat> May God bless the reading of his holy word. When Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, he brought up an analogy everyone can identify with and ponder. He wrote in Romans 5, verse 7, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The question before us this morning is, what would you die for? This is an all-important question. Who would you die for? Everyone has one and only one life to live and one death to die. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 tells us, for the living know that they will die. Most of us will physically die because of something outside of our control, like an illness or an accident. But once in a while, people are called upon to willingly die for Christ. It happens in many places in the world, even today, where Christianity is illegal. When we hear such stories, we all wonder, how would we react? What would we do? We think of the long prison terms of men like John Bunyan, who was in prison for 12 years. We think of people being burned at the stake and other horrifying tortures and deprivations that God's people have endured through the ages. I read Fox's Book of Martyrs when I was 19 years old, and it broke my heart to hear what our dear brothers and sisters have endured and continue to endure in certain places of the world today. Tradition tells us that Christ's apostles died for the gospel that they preached. For most of American history, it has not been dangerous or costly to follow Christ. There have been times in which it was very costly, however, for certain men like, for example, J. Gresham Machen, who was persecuted and ultimately excommunicated by the progressives and the liberals who had captured and destroyed the PCUSA about 100 years ago. Machen suffered for the sake of the gospel. Even his book, Christianity and Liberalism, which every Christian needs to own and, and have read, is a deeply evangelistic book. And it contains some of the most heartwarming pronouncements of the gospel I have ever read. Machen wrote this, quote, Thus it may be said of the modern liberal church, as of Jerusalem of Paul's day, that she is in bondage with her children. God grant that she may turn again to the liberty of the gospel of Christ. The liberty of the gospel depends upon the gift of God by which the Christian life is begun, a gift which involves justification or the removal of the guilt of sin and the establishment of a right relation between the believer and God and regeneration or the new birth which makes of the Christian man a new creature. End quote. Machen was detested by his fellow Presbyterians. He was detested by them. They detested him because of his love for God's law, his love for Christ's gospel, of a full and free salvation by belief in Christ alone and not by works. He endured much at the hands of wicked men for the cause of God and truth. 
The fact is, however, Machen was not being persecuted by Christians, but by unbelievers who had infiltrated his denomination and taken it over. We need to ask ourselves the question, what would we suffer for? What would you die for? In what circumstances would you or have you been tempted to deny Christ or to soft-pedal what you know to be true when it comes to what is right and wrong? The passage here in Luke is direct and it's absolute in its statements. While it is not addressing the means by which sinners are justified before God or adopted into his family, it is a description of those who are justified and those who are adopted into God's family. Last time we were together, we heard this description of every single disciple of Christ. You see it in Luke 9, 23. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. <clears throat> it is absolute and unqualified. If anyone wishes to come after Jesus, he has to deny himself. He must deny himself. It is necessary that he deny himself. The invitation to knowing the God of heaven and earth and the, cr the creator of all things is first and foremost, you must deny yourself. This means that your goals, priorities, agenda, dreams, aspirations, desires, attractions, and you yourself as a whole person must be denied by you. Who is to deny you? You are. Deny yourself, Jesus said. Some people refuse to deny themselves, and they do whatever it is they desire most of all at, at that moment, no matter how grievously God has sinned against or other people are sinned against in the process. The first step to know God and to being a disciple of Christ is that you yourself must deny you yourself. And you live day in and day out, taking up your cross, Jesus said. If anyone wants to be my disciple, he has to take up his cross every day. You die to self, to selfish desires, to selfish ambitions. You die to living a simple life of peace and quiet, doing everything you want just how you want it, and getting angry when things don't happen the way you want them to. You die to this. You take up your cross daily, he said. You die upon your cross daily to sin, to selfishness, to envy, to sinful hatred, to anti-God desires that you may have. You die to yourself. You die to the old man. You die to the former way of life. Every day, you're putting off the old and putting on the new. You put off the old that's growing corrupt, Paul said in Ephesians 4, according to the deceitful lusts. And you become more and more renewed in the image of God every day in true righteousness and holiness. There's no such thing as a Christian. Please hear me. There's no such thing as a Christian who is not at war constantly, daily, with all that remains of sin in their hearts, their desires, their affections, and actions. Christians hate their remaining sin, although they find themselves often doing those very things that they hate. Nevertheless, they will daily die to sin and to self. This is true of every single disciple of Christ without exception. To be a disciple of Christ and come after him by definition means you become a learner. That is what the Greek term disciple <coughs> means. Mathetes means a learner. A person who has no interest in learning the word of God in scripture, a person who has no interest in killing off their sin, no interest in pursuing holiness, no interest in being part of a local church, no interest in studying the word of God and the doctrines of the Bible, that person is not a learner. A Christian who doesn't want to learn what they don't know, a Christian who doesn't want to study and open the word of God and have it change their thoughts and change the way they look at everything, they're not a disciple of Christ. To enlist as a disciple means you become a learner, a student. In the heart of every human being, there are many things that concern them in life. If you were to ask anyone, including myself, what are the things that concern you in life right now? What is going on in your life right now? What, what are you bothered by right now? What are the concerns that you have? What are your responsibilities and <coughs> pardon me, headaches and issues that you're facing in life? Here's the main thing to consider. If you listed them out on a piece of paper, there's only one thing that can be first. There's only one thing you can write down as the most important. In your list of concerns and order of priority, there's only one thing in the first slot. And Jesus told us what the first thing must be. He said in Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The kingdom of God and his righteousness, that is always first in the life of a true disciple. 
Conversion of a dead person to Christ involves the erasing of whatever used to be number one on that list. That thing becomes demoted. It becomes down to number two or ten or one hundred. Whatever used to sit in that slot is knocked down by the new thing. Obeying Christ. Obedience to our new master, Jesus. That takes first place. Obeying the Lord becomes more important than anything, including our own lives. Love for our God and his law, his truth, his son, his people, and his ways. That becomes priority number one. Now for the soft-hearted here listening, I want to encourage you that seeing poverty in yourself, mourning over your ongoing struggles for Christ's kingdom and his righteousness to be in that first place is in fact a sign that it is in the first place. I hope that that makes sense to you. The unbeliever who has a false profession of faith smugly looks at their life and says with the utmost confidence, yes, Jesus is first in my life and I love him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But I just want to remind you, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, mourning the fact that Christ has competitors for that first slot, that's part of what it means to be a Christian. You mourn over that. You mourn over the sin that's still there. You mourn over the fact that there are idols always trying to climb back up into that number one spot. The true believer says, I want to love Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, but I know I don't. I long to do this better. I want to do that better. God be merciful to me, a sinner. That is proof that Jesus is number one and that you're at war with those idols trying to get back in that spot. It is precisely because we do not love God perfectly or our neighbor perfectly that we have to have Jesus Christ perfect righteousness imputed to our legal account before the holy God. If anyone ever tells you, I'm a Christian, and I love the Lord my God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, you would need to ask them, then why do you think you need a Savior? If you love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you don't need a Savior. It's because we don't do those things. We want to do them, but we don't. That's why we need Christ. Jesus also taught in vivid imagery that every human being has one and only one lamp of the body. In Matthew 6, he said, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Is your eye single? That illustration Jesus is teaching, your eye can only look at one thing at a time. And if your eye is good at the thing that you look at, the one thing that matters most to you, if it's Christ, you will be full of light. Now turn this translated single. When it says, if your eye is single, some translate that as, as good, if your eye is good, but it really the term means single. If your eye is single, that term hopalus in Greek means single. If the, if the thing you're look at, looking at, the single thing you're looking at is Christ, you'll be, you will be full of light. That term is only used there in the New Testament and also in Luke's parallel to the Sermon on the Mount in Luke 11. The term single there, if your eye is single, it means being motivated by singleness of purpose so as to be open and honest, single, without deceit, sincere, straightforward, and without a hidden agenda. Everyone has one thing that they look at in that way, and only one. Every disciple of Christ is motivated by a singleness of purpose, and that is to please and to follow Christ. In fact, every human being on earth is motivated by a singleness of purpose. Everyone only has one master. You've heard me mention that and emphasize that a lot. Everyone has one master. That single purpose used to be self for a disciple of Christ. But Christ says to be his disciple, we have to deny ourselves. We take up our cross and die to self every day. That new single purpose is to live for Jesus Christ. And Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, this wonderful two verses, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. You see how absolute that is in Paul's own thinking? Either a person lives for themselves, or they live for him who died for them and rose again. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. You see how it's one or the other. You either live for the lusts of men, or you live for the will of God. 
And he's saying, whatever life is left, whatever few days and months and years you may have left, you live them no longer for self, but for him who died for you and rose again. You no longer live for the lusts of men, but for him who died for you. For the will of God. Remember what we pray in the Lord's Prayer? Not my will, but yours. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, your will be done. Every time they prayed, they were to ask that. Your will be done on earth. Not our will, but God's. This is the heart of the Christian life. We learn that the will of God is indeed not our will, but his. And we learn. How many of you are learning how to trust God with the inexplicable in your life? How to trust God with what is outside of your control? God gives us callings and our vocations to work at, to fulfill, whether it's our job, our marriage, raising children, or ministry. In the midst of all these things, there will be much that will vex and hurt and mystify and trouble us. And what are we to live by in the midst of all that? Not my will, but yours. Whatever comes to pass, that is God's plan for his church. And he decreed that we'd be born here, that we would live through this even now. Peter also wrote in 1 Peter 4, 19, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good. Isn't that a glorious phrase? Those who suffer according to the will of God. Every bit of suffering that we pass through is according to the decreed plan and will of God. And Peter there, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling those Christians, you who suffer, just commit yourself to doing good. You do good in the midst of all that. If you suffer according to the will of God, Commit your souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Such is the nature of true discipleship. It is the will of God men were created to do, not their own will. The heart of mankind's rebellion is their comprehensive lack of a desire and willingness to deny themselves and do the will of God. That's exactly why people will not come to Christ when we evangelize them. They don't want to do the will of another. They want to do what they desire. People want to do what they want. Men want to control and rule over themselves. Jesus is telling the world in this passage here that the first step of discipleship is renunciation of self, the renunciation of our wills and desires, and the losing of our life, he says. Remember what Paul said in that passage in Romans 5, 7? For one will hardly die for even a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Jesus is demanding that we lose our lives in order to follow him. See verse 24? Look at it. Luke 9, 24. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. You know what he's saying there? If you retain control and do not embrace slavery to God and become a servant of God, you will lose your life. You will lose your soul forever. And he says in the second half of verse 24, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. People who want to hang on to this sin or to that sin or this evil part of their life or that idol, they are by doing that denying Christ, his rightful place. Hard decisions have to be made here. When a person wants to repent and follow Christ, they've got to make some tough decisions. There's some tough calls. There's some hard things they've got to pass through. Hard decisions to make. Painful losses must be endured to be a disciple of Christ. Major identity changes must take place. There may be sinful habits you've had in your life for years which have been a source to you at times of release and escape and comfort. And they must be renounced. Those sins must be renounced and discarded and war has to be declared on them as your new enemies because they're the enemies of your master. We do not make an island in our hearts to protect this idol or that rebellion or this sinful tendency. We lose it all. He says, whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. We crucify all that is contrary to the will of God. Weigh very carefully our Lord's God-breathed words here in verse 24. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. That is a promise. Jesus will not allow himself to be a tack-on to your existing collection of idols. He becomes the very source of your identity now. 
Jesus shares the first place with no one and with nothing. And what is the cost of following Jesus? The answer is very simple. Absolutely everything. We will look, Lord willing, in great detail at Luke 14 and its marvelous portrait of discipleship, but allow me to read Luke 14, 26-35 in your hearing. He says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, it has become fashionable, strangely, in America, to identify yourself publicly as a former Christian. Jesus spoke of such people as being foolish. They're as foolish as a man who begins to build a tower but doesn't have enough money or bricks or materials or steel to finish it. And it just sits there, half built, in the middle of the city, and everyone that passes by makes fun of it. It makes fun of the guy who started that project and couldn't finish it. It's worthless. A king who goes into a battle that he knows he can't win is a fool for fighting it. Jesus says a person who claims to follow him and turns back is every bit as foolish as that king. Is it wise to attack a force twice your size? Is it wise to enter a battle you know you're going to lose and get killed by fighting it? No. Jesus' point is memorable and haunting given the absolutely staggering numbers of people who claim to be Christians who clearly are not. His point is this. It is about as serious of a matter as it could be to claim to be a Christian. So many people glibly refer to themselves as Christians. It is a very serious matter to do so. You lay aside control of your life to do so. You die to self to do so. You count the cost of building that building, and it's either you understand that cost and finish it, or you don't start. You understand that that king going against a force twice his size, he needs to ask terms of peace and not go to battle, or you go all in and you fight to the very end. You die to self to follow Christ. You die, the cost is everything. All other earthly loves, relationships, possessions, and comforts become completely and entirely expendable for your new first love. Professing to be Jesus' disciple requires that we consider carefully the cost. And I fear, I worry, I'm concerned. A lot of evangelism today does not share that cost with people. Denying Christ is an egregious sin, a very serious sin. Now, we all know the narrative about Peter. When he was faced with possible arrest, imprisonment, and even death, he denied three times that he even knew who Jesus was. And while we're always to protect our own lives and the lives of our neighbors in whatever lawful ways are available to us, we are not allowed to deny Christ. We're not allowed to do that. Under any circumstances, the same Peter, you all know, who once denied Christ those three times, he would be restored and he would become a lion in the face of similar persecution. After being beaten by the Sanhedrin and warned not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore, the scripture tells us in Acts 5.41, they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Isn't that an amazing passage? Probably with the blood still running out of their backs, Jumping and leaping, we've been counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. Today, we are fast approaching a time when perhaps we'll not even be allowed to publicly acknowledge ourselves to be Christians. Is that possible? Could that even happen in America? It happened in ancient Rome many times. It has happened in Islamic nations for hundreds of years. For many today, just knowing that you're a Christian will be enough to make them hate you. Just knowing that you're one of those, one of those Bible-believing sorts, one of those individuals that actually takes the text seriously and really believes it. Just knowing that's what you are will be enough for people to despise you. 
Your presence itself will be a rebuke to the lifestyles and sins of others. This is part of the God-ordained antithesis between those who know God and those who do not. So diametrically opposed will the two sides be that at times conflict will be inevitable. This is why the soldier analogy for Christian discipleship, it's used a lot in Scripture. Remember our Lord's words in Matthew 6, 24? No one can serve two masters. He will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. The presence of the truth, the presence of the gospel, the presence of people who have repented of their sins, denied themselves, and who take up their cross daily to follow Christ, their presence will always be a thorn in the sides of the servants of sin. Many Christian people in this room or watching at home right now could tell story after story about the friends they've lost about the families who turned on them, disowned them, and perhaps the jobs and possessions they lost once that change happened in their life. Once they began to hate what they used to love and began to love the Lord who they used to hate. What they once despised, they start to love. What they once loved, they begin to hate. And if sin is what you used to have in common with your friends and family and coworkers and neighbors, and all of a sudden you do a 180 on all of it, you do a 180 in the very heart of your affections. People can't help but notice that. People will say right to your face in front of others, so you think I'm going to hell now, don't you? You do, don't you? I mean, you have to, right? What do you say to that? You tell the truth. Yes. If you don't repent, if you don't believe the gospel, you, you will die in your sins. Whoever saves his life will lose it, Jesus said. You tell the truth, you hopefully have a chance to tell them the gospel and to repent. Hopefully you'll have a chance to tell them that the sin they love, it's not worth it. In fact, it's not worth it even if they own the entire world and everything and everyone in it. Sin is not worth it. You could have absolutely every single thing you desire right when you desire it. It's still not worth it. The reality of biblical conversion and regeneration by the Holy Spirit is radical. It is a radical change for a person suddenly to begin to hate what they were once living for is going to be noticed. For a person whose eye was once singularly devoted to sin and self and thus filled them with great darkness, to suddenly look singularly to Christ and be filled with light, that is going to be seen and going to be noticed by the world. A worldly church is actually not a possibility if we look seriously at the biblical descriptions of conversion and discipleship. Jesus said, this is true of anyone that wants to be my disciple. Whoever, verse 24, you see it in Luke 9? Whoever desires, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Being a Christian means you lose your life. It is losing control of your life. It is not your will determining your life anymore. It is becoming a bond slave, the purchased property of someone else, and entirely subject to their will, their agenda, their desires. Man was created by God for God and to glorify and obey God. Man, as a rebel, unconverted sinner, has turned his back on his creator, turned his back on his creator's will, turned his back on his creator's agenda. Redemption, conversion, regeneration, being born again by the Holy Spirit of God restores man to what he was made to be, an agent for the glorification of God through enjoying him. Man was created to delight in God, to love God, to rejoice in knowing God, to have peace in his heart through trusting God, regardless of circumstances, all these things, to have no other God before God and to be happy in his communion with God. That's what we were made to do. And man is miserable in his sin, and he prefers his sin until God does that change. But once God does that change, that person has a new master, and everything about them changes. Their affections, what they love, radically changes. What they used to hate, radically changes. The first step to reconciliation with God, the first step to peace with God, justification before God, and eternal life with God, the first step is your death. Your death. Are you holding on to your life? Are you trying to save your life? I fear there are many, many professing Christians doing that today. Wanting to save a sinful identity. Wanting to save this, that, or the other thing about themselves. Rather than finally at last laying down their arms 
and bowing before Christ and saying, I'm done with that. You define me now. I'm done with this idol. It's gone. I want it destroyed. I want it discarded. Are you holding on to your life? Do you want to maintain control? Do you want to maintain control of just one little thing or two little things or this or that or the other thing? Is your agenda too powerful for you to lose your life to follow Christ? In the deepest part of your heart, do you really believe that this life in its short duration and all of its pain, heartache, and trouble is actually all there is? Do you think that maybe a little bit in your heart? Will life continue eternally after death? I can only assure you it will. Men have lied to themselves through all the ages of time in order to snuff out that haunting truth. You will live not only after death, but forever after death. Those Epicurean philosophers that Paul spoke to in Athens, that he evangelized, they believed that death was not to be feared. It was one of the hallmarks of their philosophy. We are not afraid of anything, not even death. When a man dies, according to Epicurus, he does not feel the pain of death because he no longer is, and he therefore feels nothing. And Epicurus famously said, death is nothing to us. An atheist was once asked, what happens after death? And the atheist said, nothing. And he was asked, how do you know that? And the atheist said, because you ask the dead, and they say nothing. Epicurus taught that when we exist, death is not, and when death exists, we are not. All sensation and consciousness ends with death, and therefore in death there is neither pleasure nor pain. The fear of death arises from the belief that in death there is awareness. You know the gravestones on Epicureans who died often bore this inscription, quote, I was not, I was, I am not, I care not, end quote. Yes, men work hard, very hard, to suppress the fact that they have a date with the judgment of Almighty God. Men would like to pursue their simple desires unfettered by a nagging conscience <clears throat> over against this arbitrary delusion and baseless doctrine invented by rebel sinners. Paul thundered the message of God right to them, to those Epicureans in Athens. He said to them, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. This is Acts 17.30. But now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. How did Paul go up against that philosophy that says, I was not, I was, I am not, I care not. We have no fear of death. He told them, you should. You're going to be judged. God has appointed a day on which he will judge you. <clears throat> This day on which he will judge the world will be the beginning of the rest of eternity, world without end forever. Those who blindly hold on to this life as if it were all there was do so at the most terrible cost imaginable. Those who refuse to lose their life in order that Jesus Christ may save it for eternal life will lose their only eternal possession, their soul. See verse 25 of Luke 9? What is a man profited if he gains the whole world? and loses or forfeits himself. Stop there. Your soul is indestructible, and you can't change that. Your soul is indestructible, and your body will rise again when Christ returns. There is no escape from the day of judgment. <clears throat> Men lie, and they lie, and they suppress, and they suppress, but that great and terrible day of resurrection and judgment looms just over the horizon for every human being in the race of Adam, including me, including you, including Epicurus, including the young and the old of our church, including every Epicurean Stoic philosopher whose tombstones to this day still say, I was not, I was, I am not, I care not. Ecclesiastes 3.11, God said, also he has put eternity in their hearts. Eternity is in their hearts. Eternity is in my heart and your heart. We know it's there. We know our God exists and is real. The most hardened atheist knows it in the deepest place of their soul that eternity is there. Those determined to save their lives will lose everything in the next life. People slave and work and plan and scheme to secure fame, fortune, popularity, and the praises of men in this life. But what good is any of it? What good is having everything in this entire created world if you lose your eternal and everlasting soul? 
What good are the pleasures, popularity, fun, and games of the world if standing before God on the day of judgment you hear? Depart from me, you cursed ones, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. What good is getting everything you want in life? Attention from men. Attention from women. Money, cars, houses, vacations, food, drink, clothes, fame, fortune, and all of it. What good is any of it? If when you stand before the Lord of glory, he looks you square in the eye and says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You who saved your life in this world. You who refused to die to self to become what God made you to be, to rejoice in knowing me. What good is a house built on sand when the ultimate storm, the ultimate rain, the ultimate wind comes, your death and smashes everything you have and are to pieces. What good is a picture-perfect life, a good life, in the eyes of unbelievers and of the world if your eternal future is ruined? It's a huge and irreconcilable war. The Christian wages with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Jesus' words are frightening, even for a seasoned and well-assured Christian to consider carefully. Studying this passage frightened me a little. I will confess to you. In closing, I want to encourage you with something. <clears throat> In Galatians 2.20, a passage I quote to you often, there's one phrase I want to emphasize in it to you. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life which I now live in the flesh, Paul said. The Christian life is not lived by sight. We don't have perfect righteousness yet. We will never have it this side of the resurrection at the last day. That great and final change has not yet happened. Sin is not yet fully conquered in our lives. It won't be until the end. All of our idols have not been entirely destroyed yet, have they? The lusts of our sinful nature are still there fighting against us and trying constantly to bring us back into captivity to them. Remember, that's why Jesus said you have to take up your cross every day. Not just at the beginning, but every single day you have to do this. Because those sinful desires are still there. They're still at war with you. We groan in our souls and in our hearts, longing to be perfect, longing at last to be perfectly filled with righteousness. We see the progress in what God has begun in us, but we're not yet filled as we will be in heavenly glory. Yes, we have denied ourselves. Yes, we take up our cross daily. Yes, we have willingly and joyfully lost our lives and have submitted to Christ in order that we would be saved by Jesus but hear the word of God on this in Romans 8, 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors under birth pains together until now. Not only that, listen, we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Christians have denied themselves. Christians have taken up their cross to crucify sin daily. They've relinquished their life and surrendered to Christ. They do not want to save their life. They want Christ to have it all. But they still see in themselves the spiritually poor person. They still see in themselves that person who mourns. They still see there hunger and thirst for righteousness, that painful hunger. We groan. Aren't you sick of sin? Don't you wish that Jesus was the only master with no competitors, no sin, trying to climb up to be king of the mountain anymore? You still see in yourself that you're spiritually impoverished. You still mourn over your sin. You still hunger and thirst for righteousness. Even the more you grow, the more you see poverty there. We have the first fruits of God's great work in our lives. Legally, we are justified and adopted into God's family. Praise God, that is secure and firm and can never change. But while we walk the path toward heaven as God's adopted children, we eagerly wait for the fullness of our redemption with perseverance. We were saved in hope, he says. But hope that is seen wouldn't be hope. If you had it all now, there wouldn't be anything to look forward to, would there? We have no choice but to groan within ourselves and to wait. Paul wrote in Romans 8, 24, for we were saved in this hope, in this expectation. But an expectation that is seen is not an expectation. For why does one still have an expectation for what he sees? 
For the Christian who has lost his life in order to gain it, for the Christian who has denied themselves and takes up their cross every day, who engages in that difficult work of fighting sin, the best is always yet to come. Who would you die for? For a righteous person, someone might die. For a good man, someone would even dare to die. Jesus' words are for all people through all the ages of time as they consider their lives, what they live for, what they die for, and what they serve. Jesus said in Luke 9, 24, For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? And the answer there to Jesus' rhetorical question is absolutely nothing at all. What does someone gain if they have the whole world and lose or forfeits themselves? their soul, nothing at all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful text of scripture. And we know it's not teaching that we're saved by doing those things. We're saved by Christ alone. It's his righteousness that has met your law's demands. It's his cross that pays for all of our sins. But there's no such thing as, a, as an unconverted Christian. There's no such thing as an unrepentant Christian. There's no such thing as a Christian who hasn't died to self, who doesn't understand self-denial, who has not relinquished control of their lives and given it to you and said, Lord, what do you want me to do now? What should I do with my life? All Christians do that, although imperfectly. Lord, focus us on Jesus. Focus us on your goodness during this time, these difficult days that we live in. We pray that you would teach us to rejoice, come what may, because we've been saved in hope, and that blessed hope, that blessed expectation of eternal life in heaven with you was secured by our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has fully paid for all of our sins and so watches over us in such a way that not a hair can fall from our head apart from the will of our Heavenly Father. Indeed, all things must work together for our salvation. We bless your holy name that that's true. We pray you'd bless us on this Sabbath day and be with us, your people, and bring us back together here Sooner rather than later, we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen.